Before we start this video, let me say thank you for making the light goal of 1,000 likes for part one of this video. And because of that, I'm bringing you part two. But for those who don't know what I'm talking about, basically I'm making a video where I talk about five well-known NBA basketball players who are dominating overseas. Well, this being part two, we are exactly doing the same thing, but this time we're gonna be talking about players who didn't exactly have a great career in the NBA. Same rules apply, we'll be looking at their times in the NBA and their times overseas as best as possible, and to the niggas who complain about me struggling to say foreign basketball teams' names correctly, first of all, a nigga can barely speak his lines correctly without stuttering, so please, go easy on me. Second, I'm sorry for triggering y'all's Google Homes or whatever the fuck y'all got, I truly didn't think that would ever happen. Oh yeah, for the people that wanted to see FK Udo in this video, yeah, y'all niggas got played, just like how Doja Cat played us. Uh, I'm just gonna be honest with you guys. I did play you. I'm not showing my boobs real hard, man. I'm not mad you are. But anyways, sit back, put in your earbuds because your parents don't need to fucking hear me, and enjoy the video. The like goal is now doubled since y'all want to be supportive all of a sudden, so 2k likes. I know y'all can do it. You already know who it is. Roll it! He incurred an injury dealing with weights in the weight room, so he stitched up in the left hand doing all this. First on the list of players you might not remember that are dominating overseas, let's talk about Donatus Yunus. When he was in the NBA, he was known to be a great role player with his time on the Rockets, and in his best season, he was actually pretty solid. In the 2014-2015 season, he averaged 12 points, 5 rebounds a game while shooting 50% from the field, and was even known to at least go for 1 or 2 threes a game at a 36% clip. The only problem after this season, his minutes started to go down and the evolution of small ball started to happen. And with Donatus being a 7 foot power forward, things weren't exactly going to look good for players like him. With that being said, he only survived two more years in the league. One for the Rockets where he ended up trying his luck too hard for money and when he didn't get that money, he skipped his team's physical. His original offer was 4 years and $37 million from the Nets, which the Rockets then matched but then took out $6 million which Nantes did not like, so he skipped his team's physical. Due to that, the Rockets terminated his contract, and then the dumbass nigga lost $30 million. After that, he signed a one-year, $1.2 million minimum with the Pelicans, where his usual production dropped immensely. Due to that, he was not signed to an NBA team in the 2017 to 2018 season. Because of this, he went and played in the Chinese Basketball Association for the Shangdong Golden Stars and went off immediately, averaging 23 points and 11 rebounds a game while shooting 57% from the field and 35% from three. Due to this, he was once again gaining looks from GMs in the NBA and he ended up even signing a deal with the Spurs in 2018 where he only played 13 minutes total in three games. His time in the NBA was officially over after that, so he went and returned back to China with the Shanghai Sharks, where as of right now, he's averaging 22 points, 15 rebounds a game, while shooting 53% from the field. Now, let me go on and say as a lesson, never be greedy for money, I will never understand people like that. that that's really unnecessary. But Donatus has a lot of time left to play ball, as he is 29 years old at the time of this video, so let's hope the best for him. But for real, the nigga was bitching over six million dollars and ended up losing 30. I will never truly understand people like that when it comes to money. Anyways, next let me introduce you to former NBA player and NBL MVP and finals MVP Bryce Cotton. After playing all four years at Providence, he went undrafted in the 2014 NBA draft. However, he was hit up by the San Antonio Spurs to play for their summer league team where he impressed enough to get a contract by the Spurs but he ended up getting sent down to the G League immediately. In his first season in the G League for the San Antonio Stars, he averaged 22 points, four rebounds, and four assists a game on 47% from the field and 45% from three, which is crazy efficient. And even though he didn't get playing time with the actual Spurs, he got caught up by the Jazz later that season to trial his skills against NBA talent. But as you can read here, he was waived like three times by the Spurs and always brought back. I don't know how that happened. In his rookie year with the Jazz, he averaged five points a game, though on very poor shooting splits. And after that season, he played with two other NBA teams in the Memphis Grizzlies and the Phoenix Suns, which also didn't turn out well. Due to this, he was out of the NBA, but he tried doing a comeback in 2016 and 2017 playing in the Summer League. But once again, like I said, it didn't work out. 
after that point, he's been all over the world playing in China, Turkey, and most importantly to his career, Australia. His time in Australia has been pretty eventful since he's a damn two-time league MVP and two-time finals MVP in the NBL. He has even won both the MVP and finals MVP this year alone as he averaged 22 points, four assists, and four rebounds a game while shooting 42% from the field. Not the most efficient, but hey, my nigga got a ring. But after he won his ring, he actually opted out of his contract. So either he's going for a bigger contract in the NBL or he is aiming to go to a bigger league. Who knows? But best of luck to the 2019 NBL MVP. Speaking of a champion, how about we look into Tyler Hansborough, the 2009 national champion from North Carolina. Coming out of North Carolina, he was not thought to be a very good NBA prospect due to his limited athleticism, frame, and height for the power forward position. But with the 13th pick of the 2009 NBA draft, he was drafted by the Indiana Pacers. In his time in the NBA, he was known to be a, you know, decent, all right, you know, role player. Not good, but also not bad. But like I said again, the fact that he is not very athletic and a 6'8 power forward means that he's gonna have a rough time in the NBA. In his best year in the NBA, being his second season, unfortunately, that tells you what type of career he had in the NBA, he averaged 11 points, 5 rebounds on 46% from the field, which isn't good for an interior finishing power forward. After that career year, if you even want to call it that, his minutes continued to fall and so did his production. His last season in the NBA was with the Charlotte Hornets in 2015, and then he went to the G League in 2016 for one season. From there, he decided to play overseas and play the rest of his days in the CBA since 2017. In the 2019 season with the Sichuan Blue Whales, he averaged 32 points and 13 rebounds on 54% from the field. But if you remember what I said originally, he was drafted in 2009. So in 2019, the man is doing all this at 34. And another fun fact is he didn't even start all of his games, so he's just fucking up niggas in China just to do it. He even had his career high of 49 off the fucking bench. My nigga is living his best life in China right now. But if you want to talk about a man who is having fun in China right now, let me introduce you to Dominique Jones. After playing his college days with the South Florida Bulls, he was drafted to the Dallas Mavericks in the 2010 NBA Draft with the 25th pick. However, one of his main concerns as a college athlete was staying a consistent scorer as he was more of a combo guard than a slasher. As you can see by these shooting splits in college, he wasn't exactly the best three-point shooter and was definitely not the most efficient. But also take a look at this. In the summer league, he was inefficient. In the preseason, inefficient. And I know he didn't do much in the NBA, but it has to be said, he was inefficient. Even in the G League where he got most of his minutes, he was inefficient. So after his last year in the NBA, being 2013, he started his international career. Well, most of it was played in China where he was consistently the league's leading scorer. Well, except those few years where Jimmy was there, but you'd have to watch my first video to know about that. Shameless plug. And unlike his career in the NBA, he actually has some years with a decent field goal percentage. But from three, uh, holy fucking shit, he shot consistently under 30% in his time in China. But again, He's usually the leading scorer, and as in the 2019 season with the Jui Tai Northeast Tigers, he's averaging 37 points, 8 assists, and 6 rebounds a game on 46% for the field, and unfortunately 28% from 3. Now imagining his competition, he probably doesn't care that he's literally making a brick house with his 3 point percentage, but if you want some more interesting facts from this season alone, he had a game where he scored 59 points. Sounds good, right? But he shot 40 shots and shot 23 three-pointers. Not the most efficient. Kind of his, you know, trend for his career. Seeing that makes me want to play in China because I want what he's got, but Dominique is literally leaving the dream right now, and he's only 31 at the time of this video being made, so he has plenty of more time to keep chucking up shots in China. Now, let's talk about what many of us consider the most legendary NBA player turned international player, Shane Larkin. Now, a lot of people wanted him in this video after part one, so as a man of the people, I got you. So let's start with his NBA career. After getting drafted right outside the lottery at 18 to the Atlanta Hawks, he was then traded to the Mavericks. He actually got some pretty decent playing time in his first season, and after that, Shane got the best opportunity he could have ever had at the NBA as he spent two seasons in New York and Brooklyn playing over 20 minutes in both years there. 
though it didn't come with much production. For this reason, he went and played in the EuroLeague and the Spanish ACB for the Saski Basconia in 2016, where he averaged 13 points and five assists a game on subpar efficiency. Though it was enough to land him a contract again in the NBA with the Celtics where he played 54 games and averaged only four points a game. And then his contract ended again. So he was met with a dilemma. Does he return to the league just to be a journeyman and to always be on the verge of being on a different team every year? Or does he make a name for himself overseas? What he chose is something not a lot of people would do, to make a name for himself in the EuroLeague. In the 2018-2019 season, he signed with Anadolu Efes. I pray to God I said that right or the comments gonna be mean, of the Turkish League and the EuroLeague, where in his first season, he averaged 12 points, two rebounds, and three assists a game, and he also won the Turkish TBL Finals MVP that year. But in the 2019 season, he stepped up his production to an all-time level. Shane improved his points to 18 points per game on 50% shooting and even had a game where he scored 49 points, which is the most scored ever in a EuroLeague game. He also racked up many awards this season like winning EuroLeague Player of the Week six times and also winning EuroLeague MVP in the months of January and November. He loves what he is doing so much in Turkey that he even became a dual citizen so he can play on their national teams. What he is doing in Turkey makes him a legend and if I was put in the same situation where I'd either be a low tier NBA player or a superstar in arguably the second best league in the world, I'd take that second option in a heartbeat. So I truly hope the best for the rest of his career in Turkey and hope that he keeps doing what he's doing in the EuroLeague right now. Now let a few of these stories I tell you teach you a lesson. Be a Shane Larkin, not a Monty Eunice. I would never in my fucking life give up $30 million just like that. But that's the difference in the world with people like Shane and Donatus. Shane would probably make more money in the NBA, but instead he went and made a name for himself in Turkey. And it's all for the love of basketball. I'd be damn sure to do the same thing. Speaking of which, if any um, basketball GMs from foreign teams are listening to this video, uh, hit me up real quick if you don't mind. Anyways, let me do my outro real fast. This is the end of the video, and I hope you enjoyed it. I have plenty of video ideas in the works, and y'all been supporting me so well that I'm going to get out a quality video a week just for your enjoyment, and if I can make it happen, too. Don't hold me down to it, though. I'm gonna try, though. Check out my Twitter and Instagram for an inside look of the life of Albini, like how recently how I fucked up my whole entire shoulder trying to play beach volleyball. We don't talk about that. And sneak peeks of my YouTube projects. That, and to say hello because my DMs are always open. I genuinely enjoy talking to y'all. You know, just to say what's up, basically. Also, check out my Discord. We basically almost have 100 members, so help us meet that milestone and hang out with the subs down there. Plus, I'm the supreme ruler, so you know it's a good time. But anyways, let me stop wasting your time. This is your boy, Alvini Linguini, saying peace. And fuck Doja Cat. All my niggas hate Doja Cat.